at the bottom. Looks like it's eight o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. My name is Russell Swan. I'm introducing on behalf of Dan. For those of you who don't know, he's over at the VA, but he also had him and his wife had their second baby on Friday uh, evening. And her name's Lucy, so I'm probably not going to say names or stuff. She says hello. I have the honor of introducing Eileen Huang this morning. For those of you who haven't had the chance to interact with her, I know that all the residents feel that she's done an absolutely amazing job at the VA. We had the fortunate luck of being the intern at the VA when we transitioned cases back to the VA. And it happened to correlate at the same time that the surgery scheduler was on vacation for six weeks. So she had to work super overtime for a very long time and has just done an absolutely tremendous job. So I know that all the chiefs and now the residents really appreciate all your hard work. She comes to us from New Jersey. She can handle all the other guys in the program here because she has four younger brothers. So she knows how to put up with our greed. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about should patients with hall and horse plaques have carotid ultrasound and echocardiogram. And the other thing I'll just mention is she's a really good skier and has maintained her seat to the liking. So if you ever want to go ski with her, let her know. Thank you for that introduction, Russ. Um, he's never seen me ski, so I don't know how he knows that. <laughs> um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about a topic that was inspired by a few patients that I saw really early on, just in my first few weeks at the VA which is whether when we find a uh, Holland Horse plaque in a patient, whether we should uh, recommend or send them for uh, carotid ultrasounds and echocardiograms. So the first patient that I'm going to talk about, um, maybe you can recognize the handwriting as to who evaluated <laughs> this patient, but he's an 83-year-old male who had a history of diabetes, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia, and he came to us really for a cataract evaluation he had seen optometry for his yearly diabetic eye exam, and then they saw he had cataracts, they sent him to us. In that intervening time, I think it was a month or so, he developed a sudden loss of vision in the bottom half of his right eye two weeks before he came to his ophthalmology visit, after his optometry visit. Um, he, his best corrected visual acuity was 20-30 in the right and 20-30 in the left. On the slit lamp exam, he had significant uh, nuclear sclerosis. And on his um, fundus exam, he had moderate uh, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, dot blot hemorrhages in both eyes. And in the right eye, he had um, pallor of the fundus and attenuated vessels in the superior half of the fundus. And he also had a hall and horse plaque um, in the superior part of his disc. And so we got a visual field, and this is his visual field, which corresponds to the location of that pallor, the attenuation and and the hole in her plaque. So, uh, you know, we're going to talk about what we want to do with this patient. So, um, I'd like to ask you guys, we'll take a poll by raising your hands. Um, how many of you would send this patient for a carotid ultrasound? Okay. How many of you would send this patient for an echocardiogram? Okay. Fewer people. That's still a significant amount of people. Um, and how many of you would uh, write a letter to their primary care doctor asking them to take care of all the testing? <laughs> and how many of you would order the testing yourselves if you thought it was necessary? Okay. So, yeah, it's the VA. We, we have the power to order these tests. And, um, you know, we're all about efficiency here. So we approved him for cataract surgery in both eyes, and we ordered the carotid ultrasound and the echocardiogram. So I'm going to talk about another patient um, who actually I saw about, we saw about three days before this other patient. He's an 80-year-old guy with a history of mitral valve regurgitation and hyperlipidemia, and he presented to us for cataract evaluation because he had gradual blurring of vision in his right eye. His best corrected visual acuity was 2060 in the right and 2040 in the left, and he had um, significant nuclear sclerosis and uh, PSC in the right. And this is a photo of his left fundus, and you can see that uh, bright spot right here, the nice little hole and horse plaque, uh, but he, he didn't complain of having any um, blind spots or scotomas. So for this patient, I don't know if you guys would, you know, feel any differently about him, but let's take a poll again. Um, how many people would like to order a carotid ultrasound for him? And how many people would like to order an echocardiogram? Okay. 
So, well, we did the same thing for this guy. We approved him for cataract surgery in both eyes and ordered the tests. So we'll find out, you know, what happened to these patients a little bit later on in this presentation. Um, so the first question that I'm going to tackle is the echocardiogram question, and then I'll move on to the carotid ultrasounds. So I think, you know, a good question that I would hope that there would be clear answers to would be, does obtaining an echocardiogram in a patient with a Hollenhorst plaque improve their morbidity and mortality, most likely from strokes, but potentially from other things? Um, however, there's not any studies that really directly address this. You know, like an ideal study would be like a randomized control trial where you take patients with Holland Horse plaques and half of them you do echoes and then another half you don't and then see if that really, you know, affects their uh, long-term outcomes. So uh, other questions that w might be easier to answer than that one uh, would be how often do we find things on echocardiogram when we send these patients with Holland Horse plaques? And also another question is, how often do these things that we find in echocardiogram really change management in these patients? So uh, there's a number of studies. Uh, most of them don't have really large sample sizes, but this one had 77 patients with Hollenhurst plaque, amaurosis fugax, or retinal arterial occlusions. And they uh, found in about 10% some significant findings on echocardiogram. But I wouldn't say that any of these would you know, change patient management. Hopefully, if you find a mechanical valve on the echo, the patient already knows they have a mechanical valve and they're being um, anticoagulated. Um, this is another study. Uh, it had uh, higher numbers, and this is actually not of Holland Horse plaques. It's of central retinal ar artery occlusions and branch retinal artery occlusions. And they found, you know, about 50% with significant findings, but they considered significant findings to be like, uh, for example, a calcified aortic valve, which, you know, is a little questionable whether that's a good embolic source that would increase your risk of stroke. And also, you probably wouldn't, um, that probably wouldn't change management. And just a little bit about um, mitral valve prolapse. Since our one guy, he did have um, moderate mitral regurgitation, and so that was known. Uh, mitral valve prolapse, um, there's a question as to whether to anticoagulate these patients because it's not clear whether or not there's an increased, increased risk of stroke from embolism with these patients. So they, there's some 2006 guidelines that just recommend giving them aspirin. And um, this is another study. So those previous two studies, um, they didn't really demonstrate any findings that would change management of the patients. Uh, but this one, a really small study, just 11 patients, but they found one atrial myxoma and one intracardiac thrombus. And those are the real things that, you know, if we did find them on the echo, it would be really good that we caught that because those patients should either be anticoagulated or have surgery. But it's probably pretty rare. So, you know, in answer to the question of whether or not uh, patients with Holland Horse plaques should get echocardiograms, I, I would say in support of that, that is that if we do find one of these, you know, findings that require intervention, it would really make a difference in that individual patient. But I think it's probably uh, very rare. We'd have to do a lot of echocardiograms to find anything um, that needs treating. So now on to carotid ultrasounds. And so here again, I thought of, you know, a question that ideally, you know, could be answered by a randomized controlled trial, but there aren't any of those. So then I tried to break it down into questions that actually could be answered by the available literature. So the question that we would like to have an answer to is, does, does obtaining a carotid ultrasound in a patient with a Holland Horse plaque reduce future strokes? You know, does doing those ultrasounds result in findings that then, you know, result in interventions that would improve patient outcomes? Um, so, and then the questions that I broke it down into was, number one, how, does how often does carotid ultrasound in these patients demonstrate significant stenosis? And number two, um, if the patient with the Holland Horse plaque is found to have significant carotid stenosis, is that an indication for carotid endarterectomy? Because even if we find a lot of, you know, patients with, let's say, 80% stenosis on the, the ultrasound, but that is not an indication for endarterectomy, then, you know, what's the point of really getting that test? So um, this is a study that w had 237 patients with Hollenhurst plaques, so that's a pretty good sample size, and they found 13% um, 
with greater than 70% stenosis um, of that ipsilateral um, internal carotid artery. And I'd say that's pretty, there are a lot of studies like this, and that's pretty, you know, average. They found maybe 5 to 20% with um, significant or severe carotid stenosis. So I'm going to go back to um, the patients that we talked about in the beginning and give you their results. So patient number one who had the hemiretinal artery occlusion that was symptomatic, he had um, carotid dopplers on both sides and they showed diffuse plaques but no significant stenosis. He also had the echo that showed no embolic source. And patient number two um, who had the asymptomatic Hollenhorst plaque uh, with the photo that I showed you in his left eye, his carotid ultrasound showed plaque and greater than, oops, that's a less than sign, but greater than 70% stenosis um, on that same side. So that, you know, is definitely classified as severe stenosis. And his echocardiogram showed uh, mitral valve prolapse with mild to moderate mitral valve regurgitation, which we already mentioned, you know, there is a questionable association between that and embolic strokes. Um, so uh, we talked about question number one, which is how often do we find things on carotid ultrasound? And now I'm going to talk about number two, which is that in patients with Hollenhorst plaques that are found to have severe carotid stenosis, um, should they have carotid endarterectomy? So there's, I found, I was able to find one study that directly addressed this. This is a re retrospective case series. Um, and they looked at uh, 28 eyes that had Hollenhorst plaques and then had ipsilateral endarterectomy and 37 eyes that had Hollenhorst plaques that were managed medically. And they kind of broke it down. They followed this group for about four years and they found that um, 28 of these patients or eyes got new Hollenhurst plaques. One had a late stroke and one <coughs> had a perioperative stroke. And then these eyes that were, uh, or patients that were managed me medically, they had two ho new Hollenhurst plaques, two late strokes, and one late TIA. And they didn't really talk about whether the difference between these two groups was significant. Um, their conclusion was that doing the surgery doesn't prevent strokes, simply, I think, because well, one I of these patients. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was just trying to say that in a nice way, but I do think that the reason they didn't mention any statistical tests on this part of their study was that there wasn't any significance. Um, yeah, so this was the study that most directly addressed the question of whether these patients should have endarterectomy, but it's not really conclusive and it doesn't help us figure out what to do. Um, so I thought I'd look at the general guidelines for carotid endarterectomy. It's pretty clear that for patients that are, have symptomatic carotid stenosis and severe, um, so they have either TIAs or strokes and they have, you know, greater than 70% stenosis, it's really of a benefit to them um, to have <coughs> that surgery. However, for patients that are asymptomatic and have that severe stenosis, it's not as clear. Um, you can look at the perioperative morbidity and mortality, and that's pretty high. So that means within those 30 days after having that surgery, you know, your chances of having a disabling stroke or heart attack or dying um, are, you know, I think that's high, like 5% of dying, you know, or having a major stroke in one month. So you have to weigh that versus, you know, their uh, risk reduction of stroke over the next, you know, few years. So I would say, you know, in general, they don't really recommend uh, surgery for asymptomatic carotid stenosis in most people, but it's very clear that for symptomatic patients, um, they should have the surgery. But, you know, that doesn't really address the question of, do we think Hollenhorst plaques should be categorized as symptomatic or asymptomatic? So, you know, some people would consider it to be symptomatic because you obviously see an embolus, you know, that could have come from the carotid artery. Um, however, I did read a review article where they categorized it as asymptomatic. Um, and maybe it should depend on whether the patient has symptoms from their um, Hollenhorst plaque or not. Um, so let's look at, you know, how we can really uh, break this question down of how to categorize um, these patients with Hollenhorst plaques. So we can look at the stroke risk in these patients. Um, patients with asymptomatic stenosis have a lot lower um, future stroke risk and patients with symptomatic stenosis have a higher stroke risk. 
And we can look at the timing. With the um, symptomatic patients, uh, we know that um, their plaque is unstable and we need to address that soon, whereas the asymptomatic patients, we don't know, you know if that plaque um, is stable or unstable or when we really need to take care of it. So I looked at um, one study that examined whether patients with Hollenhurst plaques had increased risk of stroke. And they do definitely have um, increased risk of stroke compared to the general population. Um, this, this is about, this is full data from um, two studies, one from um, Wisconsin and one from Australia, that shows that um, after 10 years, about, you know, 12 percent of the patients died from stroke that had Hollenhorst plaque. Um, I tried to compare that to, you know, data that we had from those other studies from, um, as to whether, you know, how that compares to symptomatic carotid stenosis versus asymptomatic carotid stenosis, but it's not really, um, it, it doesn't really match up because this is deaths from stroke and this is major stroke rates. So it's hard to tell from the stroke risk whether to categorize them as symptomatic or asymptomatic. But I think it's more clear when we look at the timing that uh, patients with Hollenhurst plaques that are symptomatic from them should probably cat be categorized uh, with the symptomatic carotid stenosis patients. Um, so I talked a little bit about this, but patients, for example, that have a stroke and that's associated with severe carotid stenosis on that side, we know clearly you know, that at that time that plaque is unstable. So they showed that a lot of the benefit of carotid and arterectomy is when it's done pretty soon after, weeks to maybe you know, a few months after um, their event. Uh, because after that time, you know, the plaque just gets more stable and they're not as much of a high risk for stroke. And then, so we, when we look at the patients with Hollenhorst plaques and they're asymptomatic, we actually don't know how long that plaque's been there. Uh, some of these studies you know, show that um, mean residence time of 33 months, so it could have been there for two years and maybe they don't have a high risk of stroke anymore and they don't, wouldn't really benefit from as much from an anarterectomy. So I think you know, really looking at this uh, timing issue, um, it demonstrates that it's important you know, if we can find out whether the patient has symptoms to associate that um, with their Holland horse plaque. So let's say we do have someone um, who knows, you know, like that guy, he was like two weeks ago, I lost the lower vision in my right eye and we see his plaque there. So what will we do about that? You know, do, do, is that an indication for NR directomy? Um, so this wasn't really studied in those major NR directomy trials. However, amaurosis fugax was included um, in the, the trials regarding whether um, NR directomy is beneficial. So this is one of the really big studies um, comparing medical management and endarterectomy. And half the patients had strokes and half had TIAs. And about a quarter of the patients that had um, endarterectomy for TIAs or were, or were randomized in this trial, they had um, amaurosis fugax. So we can kind of look at that and see, you know, what can we learn about that that maybe we could apply to Holland Horse plaques. And what we learned from that is actually patients that had hemispheric TIAs, meaning you know, other symptoms from their brain with the um, TIA, compared to patients that had amaurosis fugax, the amaurosis fugax patients had a, a lot lower risk of stroke, 10% versus 20%. So that kind of you know, calls into question the benefit of intervening in these patients. Um, however, they did find that you know, endarterectomy did reduce the stroke risk, but it didn't really reduce it by very much, you know? Like for these hemispheric TIA patients, their risk dropped from 20% to 10%, but the amaurosis fugax patients, it went from 10 to 8.7, so that's not really a big benefit. So they kind of, um, so they looked at this, and they decided to break the patients down into patients that were low risk for stroke and high risk for stroke, and they found that patients that had a number of these risk factors they benefited a lot more for the endarterectomy. So they didn't recommend um, endarterectomy for amaurosis fugax in patients that were low or moderate risk for stroke. So in conclusion, I think that we can you know, kind of apply some of uh, what I talked about regarding the timing and regarding amaurosis fugax um, to you know, whether we should get carotid ultrasounds in these patients that have Holland horse plaques. Um, so we think that uh, like I mentioned, the main 
distinction is, do we consider these patients with Hall and Hurst plaques to have symptomatic or asymptomatic carotid stenosis? Um, I do think that we should order these tests if we consider them to be symptomatic. And I do think that um, it's more likely that the carotid ultrasound would be beneficial if the patients have some of those risk factors for stroke in the future. And um, if, they have if, if they have symptoms from their Holland horse plaque so that we know, you know, when did this event occur. So I'm gonna go back to the cases that I talked about in the beginning. So case number one is the, uh, the man who ha actually was symptomatic. So we saw him, you know, in July and we ordered these tests. We, we uh, gave him a surgical date at the same time. And so he had both eyes done by Dan Bettis and he's doing quite well. So this other patient, um, he was actually the one that was asymptomatic and we scheduled him for surgery and ordered the test at the same time, but we had to postpone it a little bit after his carotid ultrasound came back with a greater than 70% stenosis. Then, you know, we found that result. We, we mentioned it to vascular. Vascular wanted us to get a CT angiogram. We got the CT angiogram. We sent him back to vascular. Vascular said they had to have a meeting about, you know, they had to present him in their conference in order to decide whether, what to do about him. And so, uh, yeah, about two months later, he had the left carotid endarterectomy. I do think, you know, the, question, the timing of this is a little questionable. You know, they, like they said, that patients should probably have the surgery within two to six weeks of their symptoms, and he doesn't have any symptoms. And we just, I just recently, you know, saw him in clinic. He showed up. He's like, okay, I'm ready, you know, and what he really wants is new glasses. So, <laughs> so, but someone told him he has to have cataract surgery before he can have new glasses, and if he wants cataract surgery, he has to take care of his his neck artery. So yeah, this is the photo of him. His scar was actually a lot better before, but he came in yesterday to have me take his photo and it's just like this. So in conclusion, I think, you know, for that first patient that was symptomatic, um, I'd be more likely to order a, a carotid ultrasound on him. I don't think that, you know, the echo is really that much of a benefit, so I might not do that on either of the patients. And then for the second patient, I, I'm not you know, really sure about whether I get the ultrasound or not, but I guess we could always order them and then leave it up to vascular surgery to decide whether they should do the surgeries or not. All right, what questions do you have? Yeah, I do think it, you know, it's likely that it could be the source of the emboli because a plaque could be you know, unstable even if um, it's not so large that it's impinging on, you know, in, on the flow in the vessel. However, for those patients, there's no benefit shown with, um, with the carotid endarterectomy. So we would just treat them like we would treat anyone if we just found any you know, atherosclerosis anywhere. Where we, were, we would optimize their blood pressure you know, make sure their diabetes is under control and give them statins and aspirin. So that wouldn't, even though that could be an embolic source, it probably wouldn't change management. So. Doctor. First, first mm -hmm. of all, excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, you cover a lot of very important issues. And you mm -hmm. had a lot of questions that you were asked, but frankly, the literature wasn't pretty good. Right. said that 
Yeah, so mm-hmm. that's that's the part here that's that's really difficult. It's part of our system that right. uh, and it really creates difficulty for us. And just uh, uh, really and, and uh, what that expense is is an argument. There's mm-hmm. no question that, that there are certain things that should happen. Yes, I do think that with regards to echocardiograms, that you know, that chance of missing someone that does have you know major issue like an intracardiac thrombus or atrial myxoma, you know, should play a role in deciding whether or not to order that. Um, and also with regards to you know, patients that have you know, repeated amaurosis fugax, uh, some of them do go blind afterward. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. 
think Dr. Warner. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Um, how would medical management differ if they had like significant carotid stenosis than if we just saw the um, saw plaques in their arteries or just saw the hole in horse plaques? So um, I think I think that if you have a critical stenosis, mm -hmm. you know, then uh, you definitely need to do better mm -hmm. primary care physicians are more mm -hmm. aggressive in the manager of the critical plaques. Okay. I, do, I would recommend, though, you know, for patients with where we see hall and horse plaques, they definitely should, you know, be started on an aspirin and a statin by their primary care doctor and their hypertension and diabetes and what they should be managed to. I would agree with that. <laughs> Brian Stagg, did you have a question? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.